All right. Hello and welcome to this exciting webinar um, about how to redesign RFC interface authorizations risk-free using automation tools. My name is Alessandro Benzer. I'm with Exciting in the United States. I'm based out of Tampa, Florida. I have with me today, I'm joining from Germany, my colleague Andre Freund. He will be supporting me and helping me out if I have if there are any questions which I cannot answer. So he's the, the technical guy, a senior consultant from our services team in, in Germany. Hello. All right. Let's hope that works. Um, just a few words about Exciting, who we are, um, why we're giving that webinar here today. Exciting was founded in 2008 by subsecurity experts, all senior consultants. We're still headquartered in Switzerland. We have 65 plus employees, so we're a growing company. Around for more than 10 years, we have, as of right now, we have offices in Germany, in Switzerland, in England, in Romania, and also in the United States. We opened our US um, office in 2016, so we're here almost for two years. Um, all our senior consultants are also SAP trainers. We have a very strong relationship with SAP Education. We're a SAP Silver partner. We do a lot of uh, trainings for SAP. We do especially a lot of trainings for when it comes to authorizations, like course like ADM 940. Um, also, in very new courses, ADM 945, when it comes to S4 HANA migration, S4 HANA um, authorizations. So, a very strong relationship with SAP. Um, I want to provide or show you a case study today about one of our Swiss customers, um, RUAC, the Swiss defense contractor. Um, from the agenda, from the outline today, I want to give you a quick, brief view, overview of the project scope, what challenges we faced at that customer, and also similar challenges every other customer faces. That's probably the reason why you're joining the webinar today. We'll then see how we can tackle such a redesign project with an expert tool called the Exciting Authorizations Management Suite, or in short, XMS. Um, that's a tool recommended to use for RFC redesigns by SAP. So SAP um, Consulting Germany is using XMS when it comes to RFC redesigns. And then very last, we will also talk about Yukon, uh, Unified Connectivity, um, what that has to do with RFCs and how and how we can implement or how you can use um, Yukon when it comes to RFC hardening. Um, a few housekeeping rules before we start. We have a, a chat functionality available. My colleague will be monitoring that question. So if there are any questions, we try to answer them you know, during the, the presentation or we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So if there are any, if there's any question that's unanswered at the end, please, please feel free to, you know, just um, write it in the chat box and we'll try to answer it um, as, as much as we can. Um, about RUAC, as I said, RUAC is a, is a Swiss defense company, it's a technology company. They have nearly 2 billion Swiss francs in revenue. That's uh, today's exchange rate, also like 2 billion US dollars. They have over 9,000 employees, whereas 4,500 work in Switzerland. It's a fairly large corporation, especially for, for a tiny country like Switzerland. Um, RUAC is structured as a, or they have a corporate services department, a corporate IT um, that handles all the IT services for all the other divisions um, from RUAC. They also have a sub customer center of expertise with roughly 120 employees. Um, they were, you know, in charge of that project that we're talking about today. From a um, system landscape, they have 100 systems um, that we that we um, worked on during the RFC redesign project. They used ERP with various modules. Um, they have S4 HANA in place for BW and Fiori, HR, um, also the cloud solution success factors, Solman, CRM, SRM, PI, GRC, and GTS for global trade solutions. Um, they're using a COA environment. So they you know, manage the users through a central user administration. They have 94 systems connected to the COA. Um, they have 45 logical systems connected to an IDM. So they're also using an IDM for, for the provisioning um, and workflow approvals. In total, they have over 11,500 sub-users. It's a fairly large um, landscape. 
That particular project was called Tube, and it was actually security hardening of RFC users. So it was an RFC hardening, an RFC redesign project. Um, they had in total, we analyzed over 3,000 RFC connections. They had pretty much eight uh, RFC roles that covered most of those users. Um, and then on top of that, 18 very system specific RFC roles. What we can also see is that they had 2,100 batch users that had sub all. So they were running with sub all. Um, why sub all? Simply because they didn't know better when they you know, installed certain components of the system, when they roll out new support packages, they just authorized um, the, 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 the batch users, the RFC users with sub all. What we had, what we did during the project was a productive test simulation. We'll talk about it a little longer uh, later in, in, in the demonstration. Um, we let it run for four months. So we simulated um, their production for four months. And then Yukon, that unified uh, connectivity, was implemented after the security redesign. And we'll also talk about that, why we did that after um, the redesign and not before the redesign. What were the challenges? As I mentioned already, RFC interfaces are over authorized, very often over authorized. With most customers we deal with, they are most of them running on sub all simply because it's easier. Um, why do we have to use a tool? That's definitely because if we deauthorize or harden those RFCs, to do that manually, it's very time consuming, it's cumbersome, and it's risky. You know, there's a lot of risk involved and when we talk about RFCs, we'll see other case studies. I'll just mention one, one a little bit later, where it's very risky to just remove authorization and then having you know, an interface going down that can create a lot of, you know, creates a lot of business threat and business risks. Also, when it comes to testing, um, it's sometimes very hard to test um, RFCs in a, in, a, in a def or quality environment, simply because we don't have the, we don't have all these RFCs in our testing landscape. Just think about banking solutions when we have an RFC that talks to a bank. You, you hardly have a connection from your dev system to a bank because the bank doesn't offer any testing environments in most cases. So that, that productive RFC only exists in a productive system. Other things like web services, that's even more um, you know, relevant and common and gets more famous now with Fiori. Um, we can only, or th those web services mostly only exist in a productive environment and those hash values, which we can, for example, see in a trace, we also can only trace back in a productive environment if you don't have the proper tool or have that set up in a dev environment as well. So why do sub customers have sub all? I think it's simply because it works. Um, and that's a potential risk. It's a big risk if you have, you know, over authorizations in, in your RFCs. And um, now I'm going to show you a solution and uh, how we can tackle and, you know, such RFC hardening projects risk-free and automate a lot of those manual tasks that are, you know, time consuming and risky, how we can automate those. Just here I mentioned just another few other case studies. So we did the same project, the same approach for other um, companies like Audi. It's a, a case study up on, on our homepage. We had an earlier webinar about Daimler, very similar. Um, I can see a few folks from, from Siemens joined the call. We are also, also a case study with Siemens that's coming out very soon. And we will also give a webinar about that case study as soon as we have that online. So it's the same approach over and over. And we'll talk about that now, how we approach um, an RFC redesign. An RFC redesign, we break it down to pretty much four or five steps. We'll see why are they four and not five. Um, very first thing we always do is we analyze the trace data. That for, that for sure we're doing prod. Um, then we build the roles because we want to build a role per interface. That's happening in dev. Then we have a role testing. We have the role simulation. That's our productive test simulation where we can um, simulate inter or simulate the roles, how good they are in, in a productive environment. And then we have the go live. And also when we 
go live with new interfaces, new users. There's always a potential risk that something you know, was not covered during that um, simulation or the testing. And also for, for that remaining risk, we have a solution that we're going to show um, just in a little bit. So what we do always first when we analyze or when we start a project is definitely analyzing the history, um, the statistical data of the system. So we go in and look what kind of RFC users we have. We have here a nice report that shows us all those users in the system that used that are pretty much RFC users. Um, we can see here that's now from our demo system because we're not allowed to show technical users from our clients for, for security um, purpose. Um, but what we can see here, the, the report gives us a nice overview of all the users in scope from all the clients that are existing in that system. We can immediately see what's the user name, what's the user type, whether it's a dialogue, a system user, communication user. SAP 100% um, recommends to use system users for RFC interfaces, so it should always be type system. Um, that's one thing that we can see here immediately if it's user type, wrong user type. Um, we have a lot of columns available, like number of roles that are assigned to the user, number of profiles assigned to user, um, if the user exists in SM59 uh, for, for um, RFC connections, and so on. What's also important with that traffic light on, on the right, where we can see a function group and function module, we can immediately see um, if the user is authorized through, through the roles or not, and we can also see, and that's the print screen here on, on the bottom right, all those incoming function modules. So we can immediately tell from that report for that particular user here, this TRFC, XIE, SNC, we can immediately see what was the called host, what was the calling host, and which function module was called. So that gives us a very, a very good overview of what users, RFC users, exist in your system. Um, if they have roles assigned, that's the first column, or if they have just like two profiles, usually that means sub all, sub new. Um, if there's no role, then we can immediately tell, okay, there's nothing authorized. If there are users, RFC users that have a lot of roles assigned, then the, the, the you know might be a little less over authorized, but still probably a lot, enough room to to improve. So that's all based on uh, historical data from ST03N, for example, where we can load that into the reports and give a, a first impression of what what has been used and and you know where we have to take on the work. We can also then analyze from a RFC functions uh, perspective, so we can see which function modules were used. Was it a local call, a remote call? We can see how many users um, uh, changed or used that function module from for how many hosts, how many calls were made, and also if there exists in S24 for it. Um, we can also then, all those columns are, you know, we can double click, we can drill down, for example, here I double clicked on those number 10, and then we can see, okay, those, those particular function module was used by those users, and that's the count, so that means how many times they used that. So that also gives us an, an indication what function modules are in use, and for what function modules, you know, we have to now think about authorization proposals. Also, what we also look, always look is we analyze the RFC, RFC destinations. That's just a very easy report, um, which can, which in our example here is, is a, a short list. It's only like five or ten, maybe ten interfaces long. Just imagine in a, in a big environment like Ruach, in our case study, they have a couple of hundred systems. Um, that you that list would be immensely long. We can here immediately see the target host and which user is maintained. In for the RFC interface. Just a, an easy report. Um, usually you have to go to SM59, open up the interface, and then see which user is maintained. The report just tells you and gives us an indication what kind of users were used. That also is a good indication whether we have one, um, one RFC user that's used multiple times, because ideally we want to have an uh, RFC user for each connection or for, yeah, from, a, from one system to another, we should have one user rather than having a common user that serves uh, or is used for, 
for all the systems in scope. That's just a very good indication that we get here as well when we analyze before we really uh, start building the roads. After that initial uh, analysis in a productive environment, when we, where we checked what function modules were used, which users were used, we start the role build. And role building traditionally happens in dev, in a dev environment. Um, all those role, roles we build have to be transported up to a productive environment. Um, for role building, how we approach a role building for RFC authorizations is very similar to what we would expect to do for dialog users as well. So we always, and that's something that we are very keen on, is optimizing S24. S24 is the authorization proposal database from SAP. So whenever we add an object or like a transaction, a function module to PFCG, to a role, if we add that through the role menu, then S24 will bring in all the authorization proposals. So whatever we see in the authorizations of a role um, should be proposed by S24. That's why it's very important to optimize S24 before we start a role, redes or a role design. So before we build the roles, we always want to update and optimize S24. For that, we have a whole bunch of reports available um, that are very helpful, automate a lot of, of, of uh, the manual tasks. Here we have one where we analyze SRFC, for example. For function modules, we can see the function modules that were used. We can see in how many roles they exist. We can see the function group. We can then see also, and that's now in the context of S24, we can see whether Fugger has been maintained or Funk has been maintained. And what we can also see is like a stop um, traffic light here, or a stop sign here that tells us something is not maintained correctly. So here for, for, um, for, for the third uh, row, we can here see that the flag indicates stop. That means for funk, something is not maintained correctly. For Fuber, everything seems to be fine. So here we have a few traffic that like yellow that indicates something is missing there. That means missing values. If you have a stop, something is wrongly maintained. So that gives us a good indication. We can also then update or jump into S24 directly from here and make those updates. Um, also, I'm not showing a screenshot just here on the left. You can see we have a lot of whole bunch of other reports available for S program um, and all kind of stuff that you want to update into S24. Why is that important? When we look at the role, for example, here we have a soul man, a backend monitor role, how we build those roles. And that's, that's um, thinking forward. We build RFC roles through the role menu. So all those function modules that are used are added through the role menu. So we want to make sure that we have no manual authorizations in the role in the role itself. So we add the RFC here, the function module here, and then S S S24 or PSCG is automatically proposing the values from S24. And then either we have them standard or we have them, we have to maybe maintain them. There might be some reasons why we have to maintain fields, field values. But we want to avoid to have manually inserted objects or changed objects. So you want to make sure whatever is proposed is in the context of that function module. And whoever adds that function module to, to a role, even if you go further down the road in a year or two, you always have the, you know, the correct and appropriate um, proposals from S24. Why is that important? On one hand, it reduces the the administrative you know, effort to maintain the role, to finalize the role, because you get all the proposals. But also, we have a, a very use list. So in, in PFCG, we can, if we click on a very use list, that's the, the mountain symbol, symbol here. If we, double, if we double click there, we can then see all the applications that can either be a transaction or a RFC function module in our example here. And then we see the values. And we can then see from where those values that are maintained here from where they are pulled. So we can now in, in indicate that here we have an activity 16 for an RFC name, an RFC type like a star, and that that those values are proposed from that very function module here. So that's always the trace, the traceability 
to see why we have authorizations in a role. Here, that's a standard object which is not maintained. Here it makes, you know, here we can see where it comes from. But when we have like manually inserted objects where we don't have that very use list, you know, end of the day, we will have orphans authorization because we, there's no traceability back to why that was added at the first place. That's why it's very important to update S24, to optimize S24, and then assign and add those objects through the role menu to get the authorization proposals from S24. And then we have always a traceability back through, through that very use list back to the application. I hope that makes sense. What we also do, um, there's always a chance that we have unknown RFCs that we don't know. We always scan them either through our own tool or other reports that are available to, to, to perform code scanning. Um, you know, for example, here we have a report which is not known to me, for example, I can here easily then identify what is, you know, what's what's the report doing? We can see there's maybe, you know, insert report statements or delete report statement, which is critical. So something is really, um, it's really a critical report. We can also, we always, always analyze, also analyze the um, S24 context of the RFC. So we can here see down here in the picture below, we have an RFC we see which objects are asked in the code. So the code, the authority check in the code is asking for activity 16, for RFC name, SLST, and RFC type Fugger. What we can also see here with the traffic lights, we can immediately see if the object, the field, and the value is maintained in S24 or not. So in our example here, activity 16 is, is maintained because the value is maintained. We can also see that RFC name is maintained, the field is maintained, but the value is missing. So since that um, function module is always performing an authority check against SLST and Fugger, it makes sense to update those values into S24. Simply because when we add that uh, function module to PFCG, to a role, um, if we do not maintain S24, so those values are unmaintained, when we add that function module, we will get the object and the field but the value is open and we have to maintain that. How do, how do we know what to maintain? Either you're super smart and you know that, um, or we have to trace, or we have to run into an authorization issue before we can maintain it, or we have to do a, a, you know, a blind guess, or we just give a star, which is not appropriate. That's why we want to update S24 and all the values that are anyway um, um, checked by the system must be updated in S24. And that we also do for all RFC in scope. Um, Andre, are there any questions so far? I don't know, I'm not checking the, the questions box. Are we good to go? No, so far not. Perfect. Um, I just want to put, uh, to add one uh, further note uh, to uh, one of the newest features which we added to uh, the SP13. Uh, um, that we also maybe if you can just uh, switch back one uh, slide so I can um, yeah explain a little bit further. What we also have now we have the possibility to um, identify object and fields and values which haven't got any kind of a context, meaning they don't have a function module uh, in, in in our traces and also um, which have, hasn't got any kind of uh, a transaction which has been called from, from uh, any system. And with these kind of um, objects, fields and values, we now have the possibility to take them and put them into a, like some kind of a dummy transaction, which is then from that point on known to our tool. And we always have a reference to this transaction and the objects so that we are now in the pos uh, position to uh, build the roles and include this dummy transaction with the uh, objects into the role, which you saw before uh, the screen, before we saw uh, and, and we created the role. And that's also not another new, very important uh, feature, especially in, in case of our, an RFC redesign. Yeah. Perfect, thank you, Andre. Um, we had one question, um, if you're gonna share the documents, yes, we will share the whole document, the, 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 the presentation and also the recording so if you miss something, um, you know, we can take that, uh, you can read that up later or you can watch the recording again. Um, 
let's let's continue with the approach. So we analyze the the trace data we built, and based on those trace data, we built the roles. As I said, we built um, or we optimize S24 first, and then we built the roles for the RFCs. Um, from a role testing, what we do here is very funny. I have it obsolete here. So we, pre we pretty much take away the whole testing, simply because, as I initially said, we cannot properly test RFC interfaces in a deaf environment or in a quality environment. So we will we we skip with our tools. We skip the traditional row testing. So we don't we don't have any effort to test anything in in, in a deaf environment or in a quality environment. We skip that completely and move immediately to the next stage, which is the role simulation. Why we do that, you will understand in, in, in just a second. But just to just to make sure that everyone understands that, what's the implication for that? We take away the whole testing effort. So the testing now gets shifted from a traditional acceptance test or however you test RFCs in a deaf environment, and we do that automated in a productive environment where you have only to take care of the of the authorization checks that fail so let's see how that works what we use here is our capability we call that productive test simulation or pts and pts works works in a way that we use the reference user concept from sap so reference users are a type of a user type that you can define it's a a user um, that we can assign to another user. So what we pretty much do, the RFC user here in the, on the right in gray is your traditional RFC user with the roles or sub all if it's running on sub all. And then we create a reference user and the reference user gets the new roles. So we build roles for that RFC user, but we don't assign those roles to the reference user just yet. So we create a dedicated reference user, and those, that dedicated reference user gets the new roles, and we assign the reference user to the RFC user. Whenever SAP performs an authority check, it does it against the reference user first, and if not successful, against the, the RFC user. So what we can, what we, what's our take from there is if the reference user has not enough authorization for function module to to function properly we always have the the the, the, the rfc user always has that sub all or um, previous role and so the the authority check will succeed okay so we're simulating the new roles in the backpack and try to figure out all the authorizations that are needed or authorization that, that we missed during the role build in that backpack we call that backpack once again, how does it work? Authority check by a subkernel, always against the reference user first. If it fails because the new role lacks some authorization, then the, the, the kernel checks against the RFC user, or also that's very similar with dialog user as well. Um, and then if it passes, you know, the user is able to run the transaction or the function module, and we get a return code zero. So the author authorization check passed, but we can then see if it failed against the reference user um, and then succeeded against the RFC user. And that's the capability, um, how we can simulate um, those RFC users in a, produ in a production productive system. We have re reporting capabilities available. That's uh, here, just a screenshot here from our demo system um, where we can see all those or some of those return code zero, where we can see um, that the user was testing something and we got the return code zero. So the user was able to execute, um, for example, a batch job or, or any function module, um, but the authorization failed against the reference user. And so that's what we, what we get here in our log file. Um, and those are all the checks that failed against reference user, but succeeded against the uh, RFC user. And that's an indication that we have to take those failed authorizations back to our dev system and we can do that with an up, upload download upload from a text file so we don't have a transport there you can just download that from prod upload into dev and can then optimize with s 4 and assign or build out the roles or the authorizations in the roles that you know the user had assigned and authorization failed 
We also get here an indication, that's always a question here, why we have green, the grayish, and the red. That's only an indication for us um, that indicates the red is a critical authorization, like here, for example, batch shop admin authorization is a critical authorization, whereas the green indicates for a more common authorization, which is not critical. The gray one is a gray zone. That's up to you to decide whether it's, whether it's um, um, critical or not. Um, so we then take, as I mentioned, we take then those trays and that's that's running in, in a system on a, a low priority uh, background job is, is collecting all those failed authorization checks against the, the reference user. We can then download that from a prod system into the dev system and then we can update or st start to update the roles in dev. How does that look like? Very similar as we saw before. Um, if we download that to our dev system, we can see all the users, we can see what was used, it was a transaction. In our case here, we have just transactions. That would be then the function module. And it will also then analyze against S24. So we can then see if there was a failed um, authorization check, we can immediately see why it failed, maybe because the value was maintained wrongly in, in uh, S24, or the value was completely missing, or if the field was not maintained. And then we can update the roles in depth, follow the transport uh, routine. So we would transport it back up to prod assign, you know, the role that's assigned to the reference user. And we would then continue the simulation. And over time, we hope to get less and less failed authorization checks so that our, so that our trace and our re results that we just saw in the, in the screen before are getting less and less. And that's how we mean, how we can, you know, sustainably update the roles so that we have 100% coverage of all the stations that are used. In the case of RUAC, we did that productive test simulation over a period of four months. So we started the simulation in the first couple of weeks, we had a little more um, authorization failures. And then every week or in the beginning, every day, we, we analyzed that log file, see what was, what was still failing against that new role and then updated the roles every single day and then every week until we had not, no, no other issues in our simulation. So the ultimate goal is to have zero um, locks in, during that productive test simulation at PTS. And that's an indication for us that the role um, is, is built properly and can be assigned to the RFC user, okay? That was role simulation. So we, si we simulate that whole new set of authorization roles in a productive environment, but always go back to the dev where we had the, where we had the initial role build, um, completely maintain the role until it's, you know, wor works. And then um, once we're happy, we have no more issues during the simulation, we go into the go live. And for go live, um, we have a um, uh, Sandra. Just just one point because we have uh, we had two uh, uh, questions regarding our simulation, and maybe I just uh, answer them for everyone. Because there was one question: whether um, does the data analysis step include only sub two sub connections, or does it scan uh, non sub systems like the TCP connection and so on? And um, I just wrote also an answer into the. Um, uh, uh, question box, but I would like to answer it. We will scan everything which is somehow related to our um, um, interface of the, um, or interlink of the uh, SAP system, which is in our scope. So meaning we have the SM59 um, um, interface and we have all the users which are communicating with our system and are communicating with the external system. And as soon as something is coming to our system, which is uh, uh, relevant to one of these um, interfaces, you will be able to identify all the, the function modules, all the objects, all the transactions, all the web services, and so on, all the programs as well. And uh, we, with our reports, we can then identify them and then take them into our role bu uh, building phase. So in that case, definitely, as soon there's some kind of a communication to our system re uh, in, in relation to the RC uh, destination, then yes, we definitely can ide identify them. Um, the another question which came up is um, whether the code scan only is limited to function modules uh, in the RFC calls. 
or can it be extended to scan custom namespaces? Yes, definitely. There is no limitation in that. You have the possibility to select, um, 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 for example, to search for transactions or uh, um, uh, your own transactions, including programs uh, and function modules. So there is a big range which you can um, select to scan the code and check for authority objects and uh, direct SQL um, uh, requests and so on. So there, there's uh, the, the tool is quite strong and heavy, which uh, with uh, functionality to scan um, your uh, your own coding. So that's definitely possible. Perfect. Okay. So once we simulated the ro those roles and we know they are workable, we can use them in, in, in production, we can assign them to, ro to new roles to the RFC users, we do a go live. We go into go live where we assign the new roles to the RFC users. Um, when we do that, there's always a slight remaining risk because there can always be something that we missed during simulation, maybe something that's only running on a yearly basis, maybe for a year end or you know whatever it might be that we might have missed during our four months or however long we had the simulation on. Um, we have a capability there as well. We call automated delta role generation. How does that work? It's one of our module, the role, pro, uh, the, the role builder module that automatically generates a delta role in case we have, we have a, a failed um, authorization check against the RFC user. And how that happens is the, the system, our tool um, monitors the, the 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 log files and within a split second the tool creates a delta role with the missing authorization and assigns that role automatically to the ref to the rfc user so authorization check fails our tool picks that up within a split second and whenever the interface retries um, usually interfaces retry after a couple of seconds um, to you know process that once again then the delta order is already assigned and the authorization check will pass, okay? That's our fallback scenario, if you will. If we have, if we missed something during the role build, during the simulation, then our tool would automatically create a, a, a delta role and assign to the user in production just to make sure that the interface doesn't go down, okay? It's a very isolated capability that we, has, that we activate in a productive environment where um, just to, to make sure the RFC user is always properly authorized and that the interface doesn't go down. Um, perfect. So I showed you a couple of tools and, and how and reports how we did that. I um, want to move over to just show you a little bit more about the XMS I mentioned initially. Here's an endorsement from SAP as well, SAP Consulting Germany where in an SAP note, they recommend to use the XMS. That's what we're showing you today um, as a tool to automate and simplify and also to reduce the risk uh, involved in such, a, in such a project. So let me show a little bit more about the exciting authorizations management suite. As I mentioned, it goes by quick name XMS. Um, XMS was initially built for role redesign projects for dialogue users, for technical users, we extended our functionality you know, for testing capabilities. We have vulnerability scanning, this custom app up code. That's what we showed before when we scan function modules to see what they do, if they have S24 um, maintained. And we also do creation validation of security concepts. We do role replication. We do a lot of functionality within that solution. The solution itself consists of seven modules. Um, today, we showed a few reports um, for of four modules. The very first module I showed was the exciting role profiler here on the right, um, where we have a lot of reporting. It's 100 plus reports there, you know, where we can update roles, where we can check the quality of the role, the robustness of the role, um, update S24, review history, uh, um, statistical data, all kind of stuff when it comes to analyzing, profiling the roles. Um, the second module I showed you was the ABAP Alchemist, that's our custom code scanning um, tool. It doesn't only check custom code, it all, can also check um, SAP standard code or partner code, so we can check our uh, function modules, we can also, but also check transactions or the program behind transactions. Um, 
and always in the view of, of a security administrator. So in the view of, of S24, if the authority check is implemented properly, all kind of stuff when it comes to security. And then the other two models I showed you, the productive test simulation works between the role builder and the exciting times, um, where we can do that productive test simulation in a productive environment, as the name implies. Um, and we can then also eliminate the risk during a go-life with that um, automated delta role generation, which is a combination of role profiler and exciting times, a very specific use case. We have other modules I didn't show today, role designer, that's a virtual cockpit to design roles based on usage data. Business data is also very helpful when migrating to S4HANA, for example, because we can load the simplification list into our virtual role design and play around in a cockpit, um, but to build roles, we have Role Replicator, which is a tool to master replicate roles when it comes to organizational levels, and then Security Architect, which is for security concepts, more for a validation um, and auditing of your SAP system. XMS is completely built in ABAP. It's, a, it's an add-on to your ABAP stack. Um, we license by user, with either perpetual or a subscription. So for a project like RUAC, RUAC is one of our uh, customers for, for you know, RFC, other RFC hardening projects that run for like six months, we could we can also use, or you can also use the, the tool as in on a subscription basis, a six month subscription, where we can just license those modules that we use for an RFC redesign project, for example. If you have a perpetual license, you know, same user on two system counts as one, so we only count unique users, we only count dialog and technical users, no ESS, MSS users, and we have standard maintenance and support agreements that come with the XMS. So XMS was the tool that was used to design and build those roles and to validate those roles and make sure the roles are functioning correctly. RUAC then decided, and was one, that was one of the project goals and definitions of the project, that we have also to implement Yukon. Yukon is unified connectivity. Um, it's an SAP standard um, uh, capability that was released with uh, release 740. Um, Yukon is pretty much an RFC firewall. And since it's a firewall, it doesn't really replace what we just showed before. So Yukon is more whether we, whether we open function modules or we um, forbid function modules. Whoever, when, when we open, when there's a function module um, allowed in Yukon, whoever has access can, can, can use it. And that's why it's always important that to understand that Yukon does not replace a, a, a good, security, uh, good security design for your RFC users. Because if you have sub all and someone gets access to that interface and, and the function modules are not blocked in Yukon, you can access it. That's why it's important that the authorizations um, are built properly and you know following a least principle uh, concept. Yukon itself is not it's not enabled by default, so it's it's a, a profile parameter that you have to switch on to enable it, and then it's a logging um, and uh, and blocking tool to block incoming uh, RFCs. It com Yukon complements the authorizations, so it does not replace the authorizations. It's just a complementary protection that you can activate, um, and you have to activate it in all clients and all systems to be effective, because otherwise it will never work. Um, a few comparisons when we have Yukon or not. Um, you know, worst case scenario, you have sub all without Yukon, so you have nothing restricted in your authorizations, but you also have nothing restricted when it comes to inbound um, RFCs, for example. So there's no protection. Um, pretty much the door is wide open. If you have sub all with Yukon, that might be, you know, sub, some, some customers do that. They just activate Yukon and they think, now I'm, I'm, I'm safe. That's not true because whatever is not blacklisted in Yukon, everyone can still be access and it can easily be bypassed um, and that's why it's very important to have proper authorizations that's why it's in green here because that's what we recommend so when you have proper authorization without yukon that means 
you know, we, you did a RFC hardening, um, and then pretty much you have um, everything protected. You have all your inbounds protected. They are protected by user, and only if you're authorized, you can use a certain interface. Um, if you add a new con, that just adds an additional level, um, especially important, especially adds a protection against escalation attacks. So if you have, you know, a hacker attacking your system, that might, you know, close out a few things that you didn't do with authorizations. For example, if someone hacked a user, a user password, you can will, will block then more, you know, inbound or open doors to your system. Lessons learned from RUAC, um, very important here, um, that we that you always build roles in, in, in a user context. So very specific functions and that we can figure out through the trace, you know, should be authorized for a user. So definitely go away from, from SAP all, um, build, a, build a user per interface, and also build one role per per user, and that has proper authorizations, and then you are on on, on the safe side. Um, we can extend function modules with S24. That's what we mentioned before. Um, very important to to get the authorizations in order because you know Yukon um, only blocks on a on a on an interface level, not on a user level. Um, when we do when we when we use Yukon and we have to classify all those RFC function modules, and there are 18,000 or even more now that are available in, in, a, in a SAP ERP CC system, we have to blacklist those because, you know, that's the, it's, it's, it's either the, the door is open or the door is closed. Per default, everything is open and then authorization protects whatever can, a user can use. And with Yukon, you have to um, classify all those 18,000 RFC function modules and then blacklist whatever you don't want to have or whatever you want to close, you have to blacklist. And only what is whitelisted can be used. Um, Yukon is sometimes used for, for system upgrades, you know, where we have, where someone has project authorizations to implement a new support package. It adds, you know, a second or another layer of security. Um, and as I said, Yukon does not offer a protection for individual users. So whoever, if, if just one example, if we have a function module like Papi user create, where we can create a user, which is a remote enabled function module. So we can call that function module from a dev system in prod. If the interface is open and I have access to that, um, then I can execute and create a user in, in, in production. With Yukon, um, we can either block that RFC or that function module, or we have it open. If you, for example, use um, a CUA, then you cannot block that Papi user create because the CUA has to create a user in your prod system. You know that's ne that's necessary to you know run a CUA environment. So the door is always open. So the only way to protect that no one misuses that Papi user create is to have the authorizations in order. Okay, so it's not a protection for an individual user. It's just a you know a blacklisting of function modules. With that being said, we are already at the end. Um, I will open it to questions. If there are any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat and we will we'll take them on from here. We'll stay on the line a little bit just to answer any questions if there's something coming up. Um, you can also reach us. Here's my, my contact details. You can send me an email. Um, we can jump on another call if you have specific questions about RFC hardening. Um, that was a fur, just a, an impression and, and, a, and a showcase of how we how we performed the redesign using our tools, the exciting authorizations management suite, um, with a customer. What were the stop the steps involved, the challenges we faced, and how we can automate and you know ultimately simplify the the tasks involved in such a redesign project. And also, you know, there's always a, a time saving results in a, in a cost saving. That's why we are using our tools and also SAP Consulting in Germany is using our tools simply because it's a, it's a, it's a cost and, and time saver um, for our customers. With that being said, I open it up to questions. I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you very much for joining. We will send you a, 
the uh, an email later today with the recording and the materials we showed so you have that um, all av available if there's any question please feel free to ask us in the chat or send us an email or call us um, and then thank you very much for for your attention Andre, are there any question that we missed or so far um um, so far, I didn't see any new question. No. There was just one question, uh, Andre, that came up. Yeah, just saw it. Um, um, the question is, is there anything um, regarding uh, password maintenance for RC users? Um, due to the fact that we um, our um, um, recommendation for RC users is to use only system users, um, therefore the, these kinds of or these type of users, then there is no password uh, input required because there is no possibility to log in um, with that user um, via any kind of a subgui or other. Uh, types of login. So therefore, there is no necessary to um, use any kind um, of a password. Um, or if you're um, using a communication user, um, in that case, um, it's only recommended to use that communication user for RC interfaces if there is a real person behind it and he is like using, for example, an Excel uh, communication or impressing something because he wants to transfer it. But in general, we only use um, the system type users, and for that, there is no password required. So that means if I um, have another point um, when um, uh, regarding the, the, the time changes for like for the interval for 90 days of uh, um, changing, as soon as you switch every user, and that's also one very big uh, component of the project uh, when we do an RC project, to identify all the necessary users and all the users um, which are somehow um, uh, using, for example, also batch shops and whatsoever. And as soon as we have those users identified, we try to, to separate them into specific groups and then um, try to change them to uh, whatever, if they are dialogue user, if they are communication user, and then we try to switch them first to the system um, uh, type of user, and then you don't have this problem anymore. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Andre. Yeah. Okay. Then I think there's no other questions. So thank you very much for your time uh, and I wish you a good rest of your Tuesday afternoon. Thank you very much for joining. Okay. Thank you very much as well. Bye-bye.